Well, uh, thank you. So um, I'd like to talk about uh, controlling electromagnetic wave uh, for energy application. So uh, as uh, maybe just one slide of background, when you look at energy technology, uh, the ability to control electromagnetic field or electromagnetic wave uh, plays an extremely important role. And uh, in fact, uh, the primary energy source, of course, is the sun. And you are talking about maybe a electromagnetic wave with extremely high frequency on the order of 10 to the 14 hertz. On the other hand, when you, on the other end, at least, when you think about energy delivery, uh, these days we rely upon AC power, uh, which is the electromagnetic field that's oscillating at about 50 to 60 hertz. So uh, what you come to see uh, is really uh, the importance of electromagnetics uh, across a huge range of frequency and therefore land scale. Now, one of the very interesting thing is that in spite of the uh, tremendous difference uh, in energy and also in uh, length and time scale of these uh, uh, electromagnetic field, they are governed by the same fundamental equations. And therefore, uh, the ability to understand electromagnetics and to control them can have a broad implication for a wide range of energy technologies. So um, I would like to, uh, in this talk, talk about uh, basically two projects that have been, uh, my group have been working on uh, in the past five or six years, uh, both of which actually stem from the ability to control electromagnetic field. And uh, uh, I will talk about thermal radiation control, and then uh, which is controlling thermal radiation uh, and also in uh, talking about, uh, at the low frequency side, uh, the ability to do dynamic wireless power transfer. So uh, in the past several years, we've been actually very intrigued by this notion that uh, there in fact exists a thermodynamic resource that in terms of order of magnitude is almost as the same as the solar energy. And that's the coldness of the universe. Uh, the basic argument, of course, is that the Earth uh, needs to remain at a constant temperature. So whatever energy that we receive from the sun uh, must be able to radiate out as well. And therefore, uh, there is a tremendous amount of outgoing radiation from the Earth, and the magnitude of it is exactly as the solar radiation. And the ability to benefit from such outgoing radiation, in other words, to benefit from the coldness of the universe, uh, therefore could potentially be quite interesting uh, as much as uh, trying to benefit uh, from the solar energy. So uh, very similar to the solar energy where the access to the sun is provided by electromagnetic wave or by optical wave, uh, in the case for the universe itself, uh, we also have radiative access. Uh, in other words, the atmosphere is transparent in the wavelength range of 8 to 13 micron. So consequently, uh, every object at a typical ambient temperature of 300 Kelvin would be able to radiate its heat out. And therefore, this is what's called a radiative cooling process. So what we've been interested in is to harvest this radiative cooling process for renewable energy application. Now, one of the first things you realize is that even though this is, an, in fact, a uh, really a universal process. It's not a process that you commonly see. Uh, obviously, if you walk out of this room, in theory, you should be radiating heat out to the universe. And in practice, you don't get any colder. And the, one of the problems is, of course, that if you actually go out of the room, the sun is going to heat you up. So by this argument, uh, what you would need uh, is to construct photonic structure that will reflect all the sunlight and therefore it behave as a very good mirror in the visible wavelength range, but in the meantime, radiate very efficiently in the 8 to 13 micron window. And this become, therefore, an interesting electromagnetics problem that we can tackle. And so uh, we actually made some of these structures, and uh, um, on the right here um, is the uh, a multi-layer structure we made out of silver, uh, with a, a silica and hafnium oxide as the material, where the thermal radiation come from the silicon oxygen uh, phonon vibration, and the hafnium oxide was put in to tailor the thermal emissivity spectrum. So this structure actually is a very good mirror uh, in the entire wavelength range uh, that where there's solar radiation from about 300 nanometer to two micron, 
but in the meantime, it has very strong thermal emissivity. So we made it on an A-in wafer, and Ashwas Raman, who led the project, has the uh, uh, face here. So, and then we put it on the uh, uh, roof of the Packer Electrical Engineering Building. So what you come to see is that at the peak sunlight of 900 watt per meter square, the structure also has a temperature that's about five degrees Celsius below the ambient. Uh, this is entirely passive without using any electricity. So uh, this really is a work that had pointed to a possibility that previously has not been recognized before and generate actually substantial interest. Many groups now around the world are reproducing and extending these results. And here are some of the highlights. Uh, one of the works that I particularly like, this is work from Nanfang Yu's group at Columbia, uh, who pointed out that a particular ant uh, in the Sahara Desert, uh, this is something called silver ant, apparently uh, has the uh, spectrum in the solar and thermal wavelength range that's very similar to what we have done. And therefore, his implication is the end actually uh, uh, is trying to do the same kind of work that we're doing as well uh, in terms of radiative cooling. Now, uh, in defense of our own, uh, you realize that end actually with his all ingenuity uh, could not reach to a temperature that's below the ambient air temperature. So uh, to actually reach ambient, below ambient air temperature, uh, you have to do quite a bit of work. Um, so uh, there are also uh, work that are seeking to demonstrate it at larger scale. This is a work coming out of the group at Colorado. Now, from a more practical point of view, um, most of the modern buildings, uh, for example, the one that we're in, are very well insulated. So uh, to do radiated cooling, you need access to the sky, so you have to do it outdoor. So the really practically important question uh, is, well, how do you deliver the coldness from the roof into the room? And uh, now, in fact, that system already exists, and that's the air conditioning system. So uh, one of the interesting directions we're taking is to combine the concept of radiated cooling with the standard air conditioning system so that we can deliver the coldness into the building as an important step towards practical application. And this is something that we have recently done. So we have built up these panels uh, and really modules. And underneath each of the radiator cooling panel, we have circulating water pipe. And uh, in doing so, we'll be able to lower the temperature of water below the ambient air temperature. This water can then be fed as the cold side into a water cooled uh, cooling tower and what can estimate is that a few degree reduction in the water temperature, inlet water temperature, would translate into about 10% efficiency improvement in these kind of water-based air conditioning system. And so this is something that the two of my post, uh, former postdocs, uh, Eli Goldstein and Ashwat Raman, have now started the company SkyCool uh, in trying to commercialize this technology. From a more fundamental point of view, uh, one of the questions one can ask is, well, in our initial experiment, we get about a few degree, five Kelvin actually, reduction of the temperature. Now, exactly how cold can you actually get in these kind of experiments? And theoretically, if you think about it, the universe is three Kelvin, or minus 270 degrees. So if you are trying to establish equilibrium to the universe, in principle, you should get three Kelvin. And uh, in fact, if you have the transmission spectrum of the atmosphere that happen to be 100% at a particular wavelength range, then from a photonic side, you can build a filter so that you only have a mission there. And in this case, theoretically, you would be able to get three Kelvin. Now, in practice, um, we don't actually have 100% transmission in the atmosphere. The blue regions here is the uh, transmission spectrum of Stanford, California, so it's right here. Uh, so it's not 100%, but it's actually pretty good. It's about 90% transmission uh, in the 8 to 13 micron window. So a while back, uh, when we did the initial work, we predict then that if you build something that looks like this with emissivity spectrum indicated by red curve here, you will get a temperature that's about 40 to 60 degrees Celsius below the ambient air temperature. And in other words, you would be able to do under the sun 
a temperature that's far below freezing. And that's a theoretical prediction that we made in 2013. And so, uh, more recently, with the support of GSAP and uh, uh, Dr. Zhen Chen, who is sitting back there, uh, did this uh, experiment uh, where he basically took the radiative cooler and also built a thermal setup with a vacuum chamber that cut off all the parasitic heat loss. And he was able to experimentally demonstrate a 40 degrees Celsius reduction from the ambient air temperature under the sun over a period of about 36 hours. So uh, this gives you the possibility, in fact, of thinking about off-grid medicine and food storage at very low temperature without the need for any electricity. So it's a, something that we're continuing to pursue. So um, that concludes, I guess, the first part of my talk where I want to give you a very quick overview of some of our effort in thinking about controlling electromagnetic wave in the visible and also in the infrared wavelength range. In the second half of my talk, I like to uh, switch gear a bit and talk about an idea that we've been pursuing actually for quite a while uh, that is uh, related to wireless power transfer. So uh, in 2007, there was a uh, really uh, very influential experiment carried out by MIT, a group at MIT, Maureen Soliatri's group, uh, to show that you can do resonant wireless power transfer over a distance of about a meter or so. And uh, so one of the interesting things, so uh, this is, they have two coil basically, and without any wire in between, they were able to light the light bulb up on the receiving coil. Uh, one of the interesting points about this kind of scheme uh, is that uh, this is uh, what's called a near-field transfer, so it doesn't require line of sight. Uh, in fact, uh, these gentlemen are all standing or sitting uh, in between the coils, and that has no obvious effect on the wireless power transfer itself. And also, uh, this is experiment that uh, was done 10 years ago, and I knew these gentlemen quite well, so uh, they still look somewhat like that uh, <laughs> 10 years later. Uh, now, uh, if you, uh, six watt electricity uh, in the wire is probably not something that you routinely would want to touch. And in this case, the power actually did transfer through them, okay? So uh, this is a very interesting experiment and uh, uh, got us actually to think about many interesting opportunities. And now, in spite of uh, a lot of interest about this work, there is one thing that it turned out that one, uh, this doesn't do, and that's something that we're trying to improve. And so we got into this business uh, because uh, uh, Richard, uh, Dr. Richard Sassoon, and also Dr. Sven Belker uh, in 2009-ish uh, came to pay me a visit. And uh, Richard basically was asking me, well, uh, there was this MIT work coming out, which is quite interesting. Can we use that to do wireless power transfer to a moving vehicle, to a car that's actually driving, for example, at a highway speed? And uh, as an alternative to think about these range anxiety issues about electric vehicle. So um, I sit down and thought about it and say, well, I haven't done anything in this area, but I can at least think about what the challenges there are uh, in doing this. So uh, this slide actually was from uh, the proposal that I sent to GSAP around that time. What I said was, um, I think there are very interesting things to think about transfer in the complex electromagnetic environment because there's a car body that's metallic, so you have to think about that. Uh, you have to do high power. The running power is probably tens of kilowatts. And also, importantly, you have to be able to do it while the car is moving. So uh, with this, uh, I wrote a proposal and uh, remarkably got funded. So that got us going in thinking about uh, actually the wireless power transfer. And so uh, in the proposal, we actually focused uh, really on the uh, uh, complex electromagnetic environment, which we did quite well. And uh, uh, we, haven't, we didn't do any high power experiment, but uh, subsequent work from many groups are now able to do these kind of power transfer by kilowatts or tens of kilowatt scale that's relevant for vehicle charging. The last problem was a very interesting one. When I wrote the proposal, I really had no clue how to do it. And so the only thing I wrote in the proposal is I would think about it. And I still, 
I'm very grateful that GSAP will still support that. And so um, it's a problem that gets to be very interesting scientifically. So uh, since then, I really actually has been thinking about it. So um, it would be interesting to actually point out why this is an unusually uh, somewhat difficult problem. So um, you can think of the wireless power transfer system of this class essentially as a coupling of two resonators. So you imagine that you have a light source, come, a radio frequency source coming in, drive these two coils, and deliver a power to a load. So in doing so, you can plot what's called a transfer efficiency spectrum. Basically, it's efficiency as a function of the frequency that you use for the source. You have two resonators, therefore you have two resonant frequencies. And those are where you should use to transfer your power. So if you lock your frequency to the peak transfer efficiency, you have near 100% transmission, which is great, and this is what they do. On the other hand, as the distance between the coil varies, these are two coupled resonators, so the resonant frequency also varies. So in order to maintain high transfer efficiency as you vary the distance, what you would need to do is for every distance, you need to retune the circuits. And so uh, if you do that, uh, if you do that, then you get an efficiency, efficiency as a function of distance that essentially look like this, which is flat over a range of distance and then decay as it goes too far beyond a meter or so. And this is what they experimentally demonstrated. But the paper, which is completely correct, and did say that, but didn't emphasize it, is the fact that for every distance between the coils, they have to retune their circuit. Now, this becomes an issue if you have to do it on the fly. On the other hand, if you don't do it and you fix, for example, the frequency without any tuning, then what you should get instead is efficiency as a function of distance curve that looks like this, where you have high efficiency only at a particular distance. When the distance gets closer, the efficiency also degrades. And that really has become an important problem in dynamic charging. And people are starting to build actually very complicated circuits to try to address this problem. And that becomes actually a very complex circuit design. So motivated by this, now uh, in the meantime, my group has also been doing other things. Uh, and one of the things we got somewhat interested uh, is something that has emerged in electromagnetics, and that's something called parity time symmetry system. Uh, without going into too much of a detail, uh, this is trying to imagine electromagnetic structures where you simultaneously have gain and loss. And there are very interesting possibilities where you can control electromagnetic wave with them. So uh, one of the things that occurred to us um, uh, as we were pursuing a subsequent project, this is a C project from Tomcat Center, uh, again in thinking about the wireless power transfer, is that the concept of these gain loss modulation idea or gain loss patterning idea can actually be transferred into wireless power transfer. So in other words, in the standard way of doing this business, what you do is you have a radio frequency source drive to passive coil to deliver the power. Now, instead of doing so, what you should do is to get rid of the radio frequency source, but instead put an amplifier inside the source coil. An amplifier take a DC energy input and trying to amplify electromagnetic wave over a range of frequencies. So as a result, what you see is that if the distance of them is close enough, the system is going to oscillate, it's an oscillator, at a particular frequency depending on the distance of it. So in other words, the amplifier actually sets up a particular electromagnetic oscillation inside these coils 
and the frequency of this oscillation is exactly the optimum frequency that you need for wireless power transfer. So remarkably, if you get rid of the source and put the amplifier in, you will have a situation where the system just chooses its own oscillation frequency that's exactly optimal for wireless power transfer. So you actually have a self-tuned circuit that gives you optimum performance. And if you do the calculation in the conventional scheme without tuning, as I mentioned, you have a peak in the distance. But in the other hand, in the, what we call the PT symmetric scheme, you are going to have efficiency that's completely flat over a range of distance without any tuning. So that's something that we did some experiments on. So in the experiment, we have a source and a receiver. The source has an amplifier in there, and the receiver has a light emitting dial attached to the end, so that by looking at the LED lights up, you could see the transfer with your eyes. And uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, first of all, the conventional setup is that you have a peak in the distance. So as you move through uh, different distances, you are going to see the LED light up, but only at a particular distance. And this is the experiment. So uh, this is Sid, who is a student that did the work. You can see as he pushed the thing, it lights up, but only at a particular distance. And then as you go further, the lights goes down. Now he's going to push it back. So you can see it lights up at that distance, but as you get closer, the lights goes down. Okay? And that's what a conventional scheme would do uh, without tuning. When it gets closer, actually, the efficiency goes down. Now, in contrast, this is our scheme, where, as I mentioned, you should expect that the LED will stay lighted over a range. And this, again, uh, is said. Oh. So you can see that as he pushes over a range, the LED stay lighted until the distance is too far, in which case it drops. Now he's going to push it back. And uh, again, you can see that the light emitting diode actually stay lighted over a range while it is moving. So, and if you look at the uh, detailed experimental measurement, you can measure the efficiency as a function of distance, and you will see, in fact, it's indeed that the efficiency here remains constant over a range while it is moving. And this correlates also with uh, the underlying physics of the parity time symmetry phase transition that give you the bifurcation of the steady state frequency. So we did understand the physics quite well. And this is something that we're getting to be actually quite excited about in pushing forward towards more practical dynamic wireless charging system. So uh, with that, I'm uh, out of time. So let me uh, briefly summarize that uh, I hope to give you a sense that uh, there are really very interesting things that you can do in energy technology when you control electromagnetic wave. I'd like to acknowledge many of my students and postdocs who have contributed to this work, and also like to thank GSEF for all the support and inspiration really in inspiring us to think about longer term problems and to try to look beyond the horizon. So thank you. All right. We have time for uh, some questions. One right here. I think the mic's, mic's about to arrive. The radiative cooling thing is really interesting in light of global warming. Uh, are there, have you started to think about ways, or could you start to think about ways to um, harness that on large scale, particularly over the Arctic and Antarctic, without disturbing the wildlife 
uh, around it, and there's, do it in such a way that it's non-damaging, non-insulting to the ecology. Uh, that actually is very interesting. I think that uh, obviously if you can change the uh, uh, emission and uh, reflection characteristics of a significant part of the Earth, uh, you are going to change the uh, possibility of radiative forcing on Earth. Uh, now, uh, and so that's something that we've been quite interested. I don't think we have looked into a great detail, uh, but what we, uh, but I also think that that's a pretty ambitious goal. So we're probably in that sense less ambitious. We are trying to uh, do it uh, starting slow, and who knows, if you cover a uh, significant part of the building of Earth with this kind of thing, uh, you might already be doing something good. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, definitely, and I think that, uh, like I said, I think it's a very ambitious goal to think about, but I think it's very interesting to think about. There's a question right over there. Hi, so I'll, uh, I'll ask a question I've asked of the Google car folks uh, with all the radar. Okay? Uh, some of us uh, have ICDs, you know, implantable uh, uh, devices, uh, defibrillators yeah. and pacemakers, and they, those things come with a long list of stay away from electromagnetic radiation, right. don't go near things, okay? Right. So have you guys looked at that? Uh, yeah, well, so... Okay. Are, uh, like, are these things safe to be anywhere near? So uh, let me answer that uh, at different levels. First of all, uh, the scheme that we're using are uh, something called near-field uh, induction scheme. So the field between the coils are mostly magnetic field rather than electromagnetic beams. Uh, human body and many of the circuits actually interact fairly strongly to electric field but not to magnetic field. So the tolerance is better. And I think I showed that example of those gentlemen that are sitting uh, between the well, uh, the, uh, they don't have ICDs, but uh, they do have, uh, obviously, like many of us do, have electronic circuits with them, right? Um, so that's uh, one of the aspects that I think would be interesting to think about. Uh, the second aspect, specifically to car wireless power transfer, is that the, uh, because these coils, even though they are big, they are meter scale, actually are deep sub-wavelengths. The wavelength is about 300 meters and megahertz, so they don't radiate much out. So the field stay within very close to the coils. Now, if you think about a car configuration, you'll be having the source coil under the road and receiver coils at the bottom of the car. And the in-between is not a space that you usually will find uh, uh, a human being there. Um, <laughs> Or if you do, uh, there are other issues uh, <laughs> that you should worry about. So, uh, so I think there are uh, interesting arguments that you can make, uh, both from a fundamental and practical side uh, about, but I do think that the safety is a major issue here. And uh, in fact, one of the interesting things about this class of scheme is that it offers a way to rethink about the safety issue as compared to, let's say, shooting a uh, wireless beam. An electromagnetic beam of 10 kilowatt, of course, is not something that I would be, want to be anywhere near, even without pacemaker. Yeah. One question. Yeah, I'm thinking about the radiative cooling, and yeah. have you looked at this as a way to improve the efficiency of conventional heat exchangers and conventional air conditioning systems? Because you would essentially let, you would, you would downsize the existing system because of higher coefficient of performance and better uh, performance of heat exchanger. So you might win twice, in other words, with a strategy like this and make this an adjunct. I'm wondering if you've looked at that. Uh, that's uh, actually uh, precisely part of the argument that we're looking at in these water-cooled uh, cooling towers, uh, is that uh, one of them is efficiency improvement, but also you, by efficiency improvement, you also have the possibility of downsizing it. So uh, those are uh, in part of the value proposition that we're thinking about for the companies as well. Okay, I think we're... Uh... I think we're out of time for this session. Let's thank all three speakers for uh, three great talks. Thank you very much.